Today's message is entitled, Let's Pray. And I, I want you to think for a moment when you hear those words, let's pray, what happens in your mind? It may signify, good, the service is about done. Or it may signify, wow, something exciting is, it going, is about to take place. You could be thinking, um, I wonder if this prayer is going to make any difference. Or maybe you get some anxiety when you hear the words, let's pray. I'm sure that all of us have different thoughts when we come to that place and we hear those two words, let's pray. I was in a traditional service years ago and there was a three-year-old that was very restless all the way through the, the sermon and, and the service. And I remember the pastor, uh, he didn't say let's pray, he said amen. And this three-year-old just yelled out for everybody to hear, oh good, time to go home. And we all laughed and we agreed with her. Obviously I wasn't preaching. <laughs> But uh, sometimes when we hear those words, amen, or let's pray, it, uh, it again, it brings joy to our hearts that something's finished or done or about ready to be done. Well, I want to kind of dive in this morning in the end of James chapter 5 and really look at four different situations or conditions in life that James says that we should pray. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't pray in other situations. But it does mean that uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says that we should pray in these particular situations. So let me, let me read the passage for you, and then uh, we'll just uh, walk down through what it means to, uh, to pray. Another reason that I'm doing this is that next weekend we are going to have 24 hours of prayer for the year. We're starting at 10 a.m. Friday, that's uh, January the 12th. And we're going to pray for 24 hours straight. We're going to end up on Saturday, January 13th at, uh, at 10 a.m. And uh, again, we're having hour slots. Um, you can come. Uh, the Crossroads leaders have signed up to lead. We'll have about 15 minutes of soaking, just listening to the Lord, about 15 minutes of discussion, and then 30 minutes of prayer of what the Lord has shown us to pray for and even some selected topics you can choose from. So that's coming up next weekend. And before that weekend coming up, I wanted to, again, just share with you some excitement around what I believe when we hear those, those words, let's pray. Let me read for you out of James and we'll dive into the message this morning. James writes, this is uh, 5, uh, 13. If anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise. If anyone among you is sick, let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. There's the passage I want to kind of look into this morning about four different situations that we pray, some of the hindrances that uh, can cause our prayers from being ineffective. And then I wanna look at just uh, when we say, let's pray, what should we be thinking as people of faith? And then come back and really look into this prayer that Elijah prayed and how we can learn from it. So as we start this morning, first of all, looking at these four life conditions that uh, James says that we should pray in. and. Um, Again, I mentioned this is not the only situations we should pray, but he gives these four. Jesus was, uh, was praying, and um, it says that it's recorded in Matthew. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. So if you can picture with me, Jesus is praying, and the disciples are listening. And when he said, Amen. There was something uh, so significant about what he prayed or maybe how he prayed 
or maybe the countenance change in his face, that they took all kinds of like excitement and said, Lord, we want to pray like you pray. Now, again, we hear those words, let's pray. What if Jesus were saying those words to us? Would we have a, a different outlook or different thoughts? The disciples were ready to engage. They wanted to, they wanted to pray like Jesus prayed because something happened, something changed that they had never seen before in perhaps any of his teachings or maybe his healings. But when he prayed, there was something that they, it moved them and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. So we need to be taught to pray by the Holy Spirit today. And James goes on and says that, uh, that when, when we pray, the first condition that he says, make sure you pray is when you're in trouble. Now, normally all of us would probably assume, yeah, that's what we need to do. In fact, that's the only time people sometimes pray is when they're in trouble or in a crisis. They're like, oh, I mean, I got to find somebody to, to pray. And so James confirms that. He says that when you're in trouble to uh, pray. Now, down through this passage that I just read, it's interpreted in English, pray, and there's actually four different words that are used that are translated prayer or pray. And they're translated right, but they have slightly different meanings. And, and I'm gonna kind of highlight those as I, as I walk down through so you can get the full effect of what it means when we say let's pray. Now the first one, he says, when you're in trouble, pray. That Greek word means to be forward, to have a forward wish or a will, meaning, if you're in trouble, you want to pray that you can move through the trouble, go forward, not keep the car in neutral, just rev and do nothing, but actually put it in drive. That word pray there means to go forward with the will or the wish of God. That's pretty significant. That's what that word pray means. Um, five or six years ago, I was uh, with a member of the congregation. We were in Kenya. And we'd been teaching all week, and uh, the weekend we were, I was scheduled to preach in the church and then get on a plane and fly 18 hours back to the States. Well, the night before I had eaten something I shouldn't have eaten, and so Saturday came, the day before we were leaving, I got deathly sick. I mean, uh, don't mean to be descriptive, but both ends sick, very sick. And... Um, I, I had no idea whether or not I was going to be able to fly home. I, I, did, I was entertaining uh, that I, I probably couldn't preach. I was looking at other alternatives. And uh, so finally, in the midst of being sick, I just talked with the Lord. And here's what uh, I, I felt coming back. He's like, well, I called you here. You knew you were supposed to preach this morning and fly back this afternoon. Can you trust me to strengthen you? so that you can carry through the responsibility that you've been called to do. And I just took hold of that in faith, even though I didn't feel like it. I was in trouble, but I just trusted God. And sure enough, uh, he began to change things little by little. And I remember walking down the aisle of that church of people in worship of a language I didn't understand. And there was a power that came over me that strengthened me. And I remember the Holy Spirit says, that because of being in this place of worship, and as you start preaching, I will strengthen you and you'll be completely well by the end. That's exactly what happened. I was in very deep trouble. I was sick, but the Lord spoke to me and in faith, I decided to believe him and walked it through. And sure enough, God was true to his word. Perhaps you can have a testimony or story about when you were in trouble and you prayed and God came through. Again, James tells us that we should do that. Then we get to um, the next phrase and he says, uh, I guess this is one condition in life that you, you don't get to pray. Just kidding. It says when you're happy, what should you do? He says, sing. <laughs> I like that. Uh, James probably hadn't ever heard of country music before. <laughs> because country music is you know, kind of sad songs, so he probably wasn't familiar with that, but it says we should sing. 
if we're happy. And again, I'm not suggesting don't pray. That's what James says to do. I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I encountered, I guess, in the country of Iran, that uh, publicly it's against the law to dance, publicly, because it means you're happy. And they don't want to see happy people displayed. Well, there's this older gentleman, he's about 70 years old. He just defied the law and he would go outside of a shop and he would dance just, be, just, and again, he'd have some music playing and the young people would come around him and they would just, they would have a scene and they tried to arrest him and put him in prison and the people rose up and to my understanding is they've actually changed the law now in Iran that when people are happy, they can dance publicly. And so uh, we, we find here that James says, if you're happy, sing. The next life condition, he says, when you're sick, you should pray. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with uh, oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. Wow, what a verse. And this verse is, uh, is used to, uh, to, to pray. In fact, this, again, this is a little different Greek word than the, the previous one. Is, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sorry, this one is actually the same as the previous one. So to pray forward, to pray the will or the wish of God into that. Now, this one does have an added component, is it's written in the middle voice. What does that mean? It, it means basically if you don't pray, it won't happen. And as you pray, you actually benefit yourself. That's what it says. That's what the middle voice means. Now pay attention to that. It doesn't come through in our English language because sometimes we think uh, we'll just have other people pray and we won't engage. But that's not what the word says. It word says that whoever is sick needs to engage at the level that they can in order for them to benefit and get well. Again, you have other people praying, in this case, the elders. Now, why does James specifically mention the elders? Because Jesus basically taught that every believer had the authority to pray for the sick and they would get well. In fact, in Matthew 10, he sends out his 12 disciples specifically saying, pray for the sick, and it happened, they got well. In Luke chapter 10, it records that he sent out the 70. So it was more than just the 12 disciples, which we could equate to the elders, so to speak, and the 70 went out and he gave them the uh, specific uh, challenge to pray for the sick. And they did. And they got well. In uh, Mark chapter 16, it says that those who believe these signs shall follow them. And one of the signs following is they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So Jesus clearly taught that believers just in faith can pray for the sick and the sick will recover. So why does he specifically mention the elders here? Well, one of the things that, that I've noticed, uh, and again, just reading into the verse a little bit, is that the person was too sick to come to the meeting or to the gathering, we would say, to church. So it was a home visit that the elders went to. Now, the second thing, why does he mention the elders, is that maybe nobody else in the church had faith for sick people to get well. And you would hope that the elders, the governing elders of the church would have faith to believe that the sick would get well. So he maybe sent them because they were the ones that had the faith to see the person uh, or they were praying in faith. Now the other uh, component in this is it, it, it isn't because they were elders, it was because they prayed in faith, the word says that, but it also then says the Lord raised them up. So it wasn't the elders that raised them up. It was their prayer of faith, which any believer can pray. And it was the Lord that raised them up. And so again, this is one of these times where uh, I would just love to have a personal conversation with James. You know, instead of reading his text, I would, I would say, James, I've got some questions here. Can we sit and talk about this? And I'm sure he would dialogue and probably, you know, shed light on, on some things that get interpreted in a very narrow way that maybe that's not what he's intended. Because if you look at the whole of Scripture, it's that any believer in faith can pray for the sick and they will recover. So it's important for us to understand that. The next condition 
that he said we should pray if someone is in sin. It says there, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, I, I like the definitive nature of the way that James writes here because he says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Those to me uh, excite me because it, they, they don't convey that they might be or, or they could be or they feel like it. Those are, are very forward words. Uh, they're very forward verbs. This will happen. And so James is very confident that those that engage in, uh, in, in making the sick well and, and also uh, that when we ask for forgiveness, that we will be forgiven. And that's very, very powerful for us to, to believe that. And so then it's... Uh, um, as, as, as James goes on and, and talks about this, he says that, again, people that um, the question is, well, uh, do they need to be forgiven to be healed? And, and uh, you know, th that can be a, a really interesting discussion because in, in my experience, um, forgiveness may be standing in a way of their healing, but it may not be. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not clear uh, necessarily. The, uh, the fourth uh, area that uh, James says that we need to pray is when healing is needed. Now, is there a difference between sickness and healing? It may be the same, but they could be different because I think sickness is related to the body. Healing could be related to our soul. It could be related to, to some emotional or relational breakdown that is needed, and we need healing in that area in order to bring wholeness. So James says, again, that uh, if you need healing, we should pray. He writes... There in finishing up, he said, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And this verse, again, it tells us that we should be open with one another. We should confess. We should not hide anything and bring it out in the open. Now, again, this, this, word, this uh, word, pray, is a little different from the other two that I mentioned. This is, it says that we wish by implication. We wish by implication. And, 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 uh, and again, um, it's written in the middle voice. So if, if we don't do it, then it's not going to happen. We have to participate in what is happening. So when we confess and, and we pray, then healing comes. In other words, it's an implication. If, if you confess and, and you forgive, then you're going to be healed. And uh, that James clearly, clearly lays that out. So here we have four conditions. Again, they're not all conditions of life, but if uh, you are in trouble, if you are sick, if you're in sin, and if you need healing, James calls us to pray. Now I wanna just uh, dive in for a few moments some factors that could hinder effective praying. Two of these are really found in the book of James, and then one I uh, went into Matthew where Jesus talks about. The first one is this, is that uh, when we pray, we need to have the right motives, not the wrong motives. And in James chapter four, verses two through four, he writes this. He said, you desire, let me read this again. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, Again, we would call that a prayer. You do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So something that can hinder our prayers is wrong motives. Years ago, I had someone come to me and said, uh, Pastor Bobby, I want you to pray for my wife. And again, it was a, it was a, a physical condition. But then he gave me the stipulation. He said, uh, but I don't want her healing until after we get the insurance settlement. I go, oh my goodness, wrong motives. I'm not even sure what I did there. I just like, I can't do this. <laughs> 
because they already have their stipulations and it was certainly wrong motives as well in order to do that. When we say, God, I want you to bless me so that I can have a new house and a new car and, and, and take vacations any time I want to, God, I want you to bless me. What is that? It's wrong motives. Does God like to bless us? Absolutely. But it's for the purpose that we have more than enough so that we can share with people with people less fortunate, that we can give more, that, that we can actually capture the heart of God to help those that, that are in a situation that they need help. And so it's not all about us. And when we make it all about us, then it's wrong motives. I mean, think about what the world does. Think about what they do when they get prosperous. It's all about them. It's all about the clothes they're wearing and the car they drive and the friends they have and the job and I mean it's all about them and they may invite their friends in but when things go wrong there's nobody helping them through they're just kind of all about them so again the world has the wrong motives that's why James says that we should not be friends with the world in other words take on the motives of the world we should have motives that are to honor him and and to uh, bless others. That should be the right motives. So the litmus test in the motives why you pray is this. Um, why are you praying? Yeah, you could benefit, but do you want a testimony for the Lord? Do you want to honor Him? And when we do that, then we have the right motives for why we're praying. Another, uh, again, uh, reason that... Uh, that can cause us to have ineffective praying is that when we reason that leads to doubt. Now you can reason that leads to wisdom or you can reason that leads to doubt. Let me read what uh, James says in, uh, in chapter one of his book, six through eight. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded, unstable in all that they do. What happens when you and I overthink things? It oftentimes leads us into doubt. And we get to the place where we're wondering whether or not God can handle the prayer that we're about ready to pray to Him. That can happen. In fact, uh, I've heard it said that Largely, people pray prayers that they think God can answer. <laughs> they may start with something small. Like I've heard it said, somebody in a wheelchair may have a headache. They don't pray to get out of the wheelchair because they think, that's, I don't know if that's possible with God. And so they start with a headache. And maybe that's a starting place. But God is looking for people of faith to not overthink their prayers. In fact, I think he's looking for illogical prayers more than logical prayers because logical prayers can lead us into doubt. Will God do this? Can he even do this? I think of the, the father that brought uh, his son to Jesus and the disciples couldn't cast out the demon to, to get the son well. And, and he, he, he was, a, he overthink, he overthunk it. He overthunk it, overthought it. There we go, that's the right word. He overthought it. In fact, when he came to Jesus, he said, can you help me? Because he'd gone to the disciples and it didn't work. That can happen in prayer. We go to certain people and it doesn't seem to work. And so we want to give up. He came to Jesus and said, can you help me? Jesus says, can I? <laughs> Boy, I can just imagine. And then the father snapped into reality. He said, oh my goodness. He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that should be our cry when we realize that God is in the business of answering impossible things on our part. That's why we have him involved and that's why that we call upon him. So faith is based on something. Faith is not we're praying to thin air. Faith is based on God's written word. It's based on his character and nature. It's written on Jesus is the living word. So things that he taught were valid for us to take hold of and to pray and believe for. And, and so God is just calling us to 
Yeah, we can reason, but don't let our reason bring us into doubt. Let our reason bring us into wisdom. Let our reason bring us into God is the only one that can fix the situation. Therefore, I'm going to call upon him to bring him in. The third condition that uh, can, again, cause us to uh, 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 not have effective prayers is that we think repetition brings results. And Jesus spoke to this in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. He said, when you pray, do not go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. All right, so here we find out that pagans pray. Um, you know, prayer is not just reserved to Christians. In fact, you have people of other faiths that are um, worshiping other gods. They pray. All religions pray in some way. And Jesus even indicates here that people that don't have a faith, we would call atheists today, pray. It's kind of fascinating. I remember a survey that was done, I read uh, some years ago, and it said that uh, 94% of people believed in prayer and only 90% of that survey believed in God. <laughs> I thought that was funny, but more people believe in prayer than believe in God. But if you don't believe in the one true God, you don't have any prayer. You don't have any intervention. You don't have any faith involved. Jesus wants to remind us here that it's, it's not about a method of repetition that brings the results. Um, it, 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 it's about prayer from the heart. Uh, I remember when, uh, when I was learning to pray uh, for people in regard to healing, and I was given this five-step model. And it was, you know, the expectation or the indication, if you follow these five steps, that person will be healed. Well, I followed the five steps, but not everybody was healed at the moment that I said amen. Uh, other people, again, think that, uh, that if they do something repetitiously, that God's going to hear them and answer. You know, I'm, I'm not Catholic. I didn't grow up with Catholic people, but I hear, you know, they joke about sometimes uh, doing um, 10 Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. And, and, you know, I think I understand what the Our Fathers is the Hail Mary. The only reference I have is a football pass at the end of a game, you know, with three seconds left. But I'm sure that's not what the Catholics believe. And yet sometimes it's indicated if you just go through this repetition that that's praying in faith and that God will hear you. And it's not about repetition. It's about the heart that we pray for and believe that God can do the impossible. Well, again, three different ways that we can, uh, that we can pray and uh, uh, not be effective because of, of the fact that we have the wrong motives, um, that we are, um, that we are uh, doubting, and then we're also in repetition. Now, J uh, James finishes up here. He says, the prayer of faith is powerful and effective. All right. Um, he says, actually, that the prayer of a righteous person, this is how he records it, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So the question I have is, who is a righteous person? And if you look in scripture, you'll find that a righteous person is one that lives by faith. Now, oftentimes in the, in, in the, in the Christian uh, um, faith, we, we talk about the fact that we're saved by faith. But it's recorded in Habakkuk and three times in the New Testament, in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, it says that the righteous shall live by faith. So if the righteous are living by faith, then that means that we're praying by faith. And then James tells us that the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. If you read the Psalms, you'll find out that it says that God hears the prayers of the righteous and he turns a deaf ear to the wicked, unless the wicked want to become righteous. And so we find out that God listens to the prayer of the righteous and it's important for us to recognize that. Now I want to give you uh, real briefly 
four things that people of faith, when we pray in faith, what we should be thinking. All right? I started out this message saying, the pastor says, let's pray. Whether it's in the beginning or end, what are we thinking? Here's four things that I believe people of faith should be thinking when someone says, let's pray. The first one is this, that God sees you. He sees us when we begin praying. In Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, when your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So the father sees us when we pray. And we need to know that. We need to realize that. This verse or this, this, this uh, uh, phrase was coined first from Hagar, which was out in the desert. She had ran out of food. She and her son were out there, uh, Ishmael, and they were, they were ready to die. And she cried out to God. And God showed up, an angel showed up, showed her where water was, showed her where food was, and told her to go back to Abraham's household. Again, that was something she was running from. But this was the first time she said, now I know that God sees me. So people in faith, first of all, know that God sees them. Second of all, we know that God hears you. He hears you. Again, we find in, in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, he said, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask of him. God's not startled by what you're asking. He's not, he's not perplexed about how he's going to do it. He has a, a perfect understanding when we come to him in prayer that it's going to happen. We are the ones that need to realize God sees me and he hears me. Why? Because I am righteous. Why am I righteous? Or why are you righteous? Because you believe in what Christ has done. You've been forgiven. You've been given a gift. Therefore, you are righteous. Therefore, we pray in faith because the righteous live by faith and God hears you. That's why it's so important for us to uh, recognize that. Then the third thing that uh, we need as people of uh, faith need to understand that God is present with you. He's present with us. Again, let me read for you and this is Matthew 18 where he says, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now, it's not that God doesn't hear you individually, but there's something happened with a prayer of agreement that attracts God to come and be with you in a greater way of evidence, like husband and wife praying together, or families praying together, or friends praying together. Again, Jesus said, just two or three, that when you come together, he says, there I am in the midst of you. And I want you to, again, people of faith are aware that God is with them when they pray. It may not seem like it, it may not feel like it, but God's word says it's true. And so we believe that it's true. That's why I'm looking for this, uh, forward to this 24 hours of prayer because I, I'm just anticipating God being with us through the whole time. The last thing that I, I want to um, remind you of if, as we pray in faith is that God will respond to you. God will respond to you. And uh, he, he has answers. He has ways through, and we should take courage of that. Again, in Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, Again, I tell you that if two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask for, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Yes, God has answers. That, uh, that may, like, wow, really? Yes, he does, and he's got a way through. And whatever your situation, whatever you're in, whatever we're facing as a, as a, as a community, whatever we're facing in this world, whatever we're facing as a nation, God has a way through. And as God's people seek him in faith to believe that he sees us, that he hears us, that he's with us, and that he has a, a answer for what we are praying, that's what it truly means to pray in faith believing that God hears us and that he will respond to us. And it's really important for us to, to get that ingrained that when we, when we bow our heads to pray or somebody says, let's pray, that, that we realize he, God's watching, he's listening, he's present, he has answers. And uh, that's so important for us to know. I wanna finish up here with uh, Elijah. 
And uh, I, I say here that Elijah offers an effective prayer. That's the example that James gives here for us. Now, um, James only writes about two sentences here about Elijah. He says that um, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on land for three and a half years. And he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Uh, that's the Twitter version, or X, <laughs> of what actually happened with Elijah. If you go back into 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, you get the fuller picture. You get things that, that actually took place, not just the, the cliff note version here that James gives us, but the fuller version of Elijah's prayer. And so 1 Kings 17.1 starts out and it says, let me, let me read it for you. It says, now Elijah said to Ahab, Ahab was the king at that time, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow. So Elijah tells the king that it's not going to rain except at my word. Now, the indication there seems like it's at Elijah's word. But let me tell you, folks, if Elijah had not heard God, that it was God's word, he would not have any authority at all to change the weather for three and a half years. No, this was God's decision. God was the one that was deciding to discipline Israel. God was the one that was deciding to display who the one true God was, as I'll tell you in a few moments. God had a plan for Israel during that three and a half years of drought. But Elijah was the one that was the spokesperson here on earth. In the same way for us, when we pray, we're, we're, the, we're the spokespeople here for what God wants done from heaven down here to earth. So what are the things that happened in that three and a half years? Again, I'm going to be real brief, but right after Elijah declared that it wouldn't rain for, he just mentioned several years, but it ended up being three and a half. God says, I want you to move. I want you to leave here. I want you to go down and I want you to live beside of a brook and the ravens are going to bring you room service. What, a, what an amazing, so he had water from the brook, it was pure water, and the ravens brought him food. That's what the scripture said. So room service for Elijah, water from the brook, and then the brook dried up. It got, it, this, was, this was after a while, and God says, I want you to move again. I want you to go find a widow, and this widow is gonna take care of you. Now at this point, I would start questioning God. I like a widow because a widow is the poorest of the poor in the land. Their husband had died. They don't have any, any, uh, they don't have any um, uh, means at all. And, but God says, no, I want you to go and to find this widow. And I want you to come and to, um, I want you to come and, and live with her. And so Elijah agrees. He founds the widow and he goes and he, um, comes and, and uh, he finds her and she is at a desperate place. Uh, she is deciding to make one more meal for her and her son and that they were gonna die. And Elijah says, no. The word of the Lord came to Elijah and he said, I want you to have her make you a meal first. So it's like putting God first in a desperate situation Put God first in a de desperate situation and then see what he does. And that's what happened. And so they made a meal and Elijah took it. And then Elijah got the word of the Lord, said, you're gonna have enough oil and flour to feed you and your son until the drought ends. And that's exactly what happened. And so again, it's a miracle. Sometimes later, the woman's son gets sick and dies. And she calls on Elijah. Again, this is happening during this three and a half years where the, 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 I mean, the, the, the whole earth is turning to powder. And these are things that God is doing in a miraculous way. And he raises her son back to life and gives it back to her again. And then one last thing is that this is, this is the time where uh, uh, Jezebel was killing prophets because she couldn't stand the fact that God had, had sovereignly moved in and was just making the, the land into a desert. And so that's when they had the showdown on Mount Carmel. 
during this three and a half years that uh, Elijah came and called the prophets of Baal and they were crying out to their God. And then Elijah calls down to the one true God and he comes with fire and burns up the sacrifice and the stones and licks up the water. I mean, it was an amazing display of who God is. It was at the end of that that then God says, now Elijah, I want you to pray for rain. Now, here is something that I think is um, significant for us. Is that, that when Elijah prayed for it to rain again after three and a half years, it took him seven prayers until it rained. One prayer to stop the rain. Seven prayers to get it to rain again. And let, let me just read it to you and then just make a few observations about why I think it took seven. It says, Elijah said to Ahab again, he's back talking to the king that he spoke to three and a half years earlier, go eat and drink for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, where again the showdown was. He bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked and there was nothing there. He said, seven times, Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time, the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot, and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose and a heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. What an amazing story. James uses Elijah. He says he's just like you and I. He's a human being. He prayed and the rain stopped for three and a half years. And then he prayed, but not just one prayer. Seven prayers. Why seven prayers? Again, I, I don't know that I have the, the full understanding of this, but I just perhaps want to give a, a, a few observations as to why it didn't just take one. Well, first of all, is that he heard the sound of rain. So, Elijah had settled the fact that by faith it was going to rain. We don't know whether, again, his ears picked up a sound or whether he saw a vision, but it says he heard the sound of heavy rain. He did not see anything yet. I mean, there was, there was nothing. It was still powder dry. The cloud, the sky was empty of clouds. And yet he heard it was the time of rain. And so, therefore, he had the faith to pray until it happened. Because he had heard the sound. And I think that's a, a, a gem for us to know what God's word is. Sometimes it's written in his word. Sometimes it's confirmed with two or three people that we say, yes, this is God's word for you. Sometimes it's peace in our heart, but we settle that we've heard God. And since we've heard God, then we pray until it happens. It's not repetition. It's pray until what you've heard God say, it takes place, however long it takes. Again, Jesus told his disciples at different times, pray until... Will I find people praying when I come? So he's calling us to be people of faith and people of prayer to hear God in our circumstances and pray until it happened. And it took seven times. Again, I don't understand why seven times. Maybe God was just trying to bring out the idea that it takes more than one prayer to start again something that was stopped. Maybe that, maybe it's easier to stop something than start something. Maybe it's easier to curse something than bring the blessings. I don't know, I'm given some possibilities. And again, I'd like to have a conversation with James at some time about this. The third thing I noticed 
is that he checked on the progress. He sent his servant out and said, I'm praying, look and see what's happening. And I think that's so key as people of faith that, that, that we don't just, just go away and not check to see if God is doing something small, but he's doing something. I often do that in healing, praying for healing. And I'll check and say, is anything taking place? Can you feel something different? Is something going away? Has the pain left? That's okay. That's not, that's not being not in faith. That's being in faith that you believe that God wants to, again, make sick people well. That we pray in faith. We check and see if something is happening. And then the last observation I have here is that uh, God started small. He didn't just zoom in with a heavy rain immediately. It started with a cloud the size of a man's hand. But Elijah was in faith enough to recognize that's the beginning of what God is going to do that's going to bring huge results. And so immediately, with just that small change, he said, ha, it's going to come. Pack up, get ready, run for shelter, run for the barn, because it is going to be heavy rain soon. And again, it happened with a small beginning. Why did it take seven times? I don't know. But I think it's a testimony that we can hear God and that we can pray until God's answer comes and we can believe that God has an answer and that he wants to bring that answer to us. Wow, what an example for us to, again, uh, live up to and, and to, to uh, recognize that when we hear those words, let's pray pray. Let's get excited. Let's believe God sees us. Let's believe God hears us. Let's believe God is with us. And let's believe that God has an answer for the reason that we pray. Now, if I could use those two words and we'll let you get excited. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us to this place of examining the scripture, Lord, before we go into 24 hours of prayer, that we come to the time of set aside for our church family to gather and to really seek your face for one another, for our church, for this community, and beyond, Lord. Let us come with anticipation. Let us come with expectation. Let us come with the understanding that you have called us to seek you in faith, that we as your righteous people live by faith. Therefore, we pray in faith. That we can actually come to the table and find out your will. That we can search your word and that we can know your character and that we can find where your son Jesus spoke about certain things that would come to pass as we seek you. So Father, let us take hope today and pray in faith. And Lord, I pray for those listening today that maybe they've given up in these situations, that they're in trouble right now, or they're sick right now, or they're living in sin right now, or they need healing in some way, that we would take courage this morning to say, you know what, I need to pray because that's what James calls us to. And so I am so excited, Lord, about these two words, let's pray. And I know that the next time I say them or hear somebody else say them, I'm gonna quicken myself with a greater expectation to see you move in and, and do what you only do for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. God bless you. And again, uh, if uh, we invite you to come, if you're listening online, if you're in the Winchester area or you're out of the area traveling through, we would love, we have people stop by that have seen us online or maybe have watched my wife Wanda online. We'd love to meet those that are connecting uh, over the airways and just meet you personally and, and enjoy a service together. So again, we invite you to come. And again, just be reminded 
that uh, the Lord delights when we pray in faith to him. He has answers for you. He has answers for us. He has answers for the world today. God bless you.